Okay, everybody, I guess we'll get started. Um, we are here to um, for the third meeting of the ZOA Book Club, the antidote to um, everybody uh, going crazy, so crazy in our, our houses. And uh, we're going to be discussing Identity and Prejudice, um, wonderful book by Farrell Block. And I'm going to turn it now over to Mort Klein, who's going to introduce Farrell. Well, uh, thank you, Liz, and thank you so much for uh, helping put these programs together. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a special uh, pleasure for me to introduce uh, my old high school classmate, Farrell, Dr. Farrell Block, and I went to Central High School in Philadelphia, an academic high school. Uh, I have to embarrass him by saying he was one of the smartest kids in the whole class, graduating number two out of 600. Wow. He went to Swarthmore College uh, studying math, got his PhD from Stanford University in statistics and economics. <clears throat> After that, he uh, taught economics, I believe, at Princeton University, and uh, he's been involved with, uh, in economic consulting uh, I think for many, many years uh, since then. Uh, and he has a really a brilliant new book, very clear and really topical for our times. Uh, um, so I'm really uh, pleased to introduce uh, to all of you uh, my classmate from 55 years ago, uh, Farrell Block. <laughs> thank you very much, Mort, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Liz, for arranging this. Um, I remember Mort's intelligence and passion for the Jewish people way back then, so Mort's prominence now and achievements don't surprise me. Some of you may not know that Mort's intellect includes considerable quantitative aptitude. He did uh, biostatistical work with double Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling, for example. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mantua Books, my publisher. Mantua Books describes itself as Canada's only conservative and pro-Israel press, and I would encourage you to peruse its website for books of interest to you. Today I'm discussing uh, the book Liz kindly held up. I'll hold it up again here. <laughs> identity and Prejudice. And uh, the first half of the book uh, develops a theory of identity, prejudice, and discrimination. And the second half presents applications of that theory to historical and contemporary issues. Chapter five is devoted to Jewish issues, including anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, but most of the rest of the book is theoretical or with applications to other groups, including African Americans, Asians, Muslims, Latinos, Italians, and others. Now, those of you attending today are presumably very well acquainted with uh, distorted anti-Israel perspectives that are unfortunately common today, in which I discuss in chapter five, section three. But what has not been examined very much is the uh, baffling and troubling issue I'm going to discuss today, why some Jews are receptive to anti-Israel perspectives, often to the extreme of pro-Palestinian political activism. Susan Tuckman spoke last night about this. She mentioned that there are anti-Israel Jewish professors and anti-Israel Jewish student activists that, that she encounters. Now, a common answer to the question of why some Jews are receptive to anti-Israel perspectives or the associated issue of why many Jews are tepid in their support of Israel is that such Jews are Jews only by ancestry and have no meaningful Jewish identity or element in their life. But this simple answer begs two questions. First, it sounds like the answer presumes that we should expect someone with no Jewish identity, say an American non-Jew, non-Arab, to be anti-Israel. And second, it doesn't explain anti-Israel sentiment among uh, highly identified Jews, those who practice Judaism, have solid Jewish educations, or are themselves Israeli citizens, even IDF veterans. Now, the answer to the first question, why many people today are anti-Israel and why this viewpoint is to some Jews, the basic answer is the triumph among influential academics and journalists of the biased and insufficiently vetted pro-Palestinian narrative. This is especially true on campuses where there is often generous Arab financial support for Middle East studies programs, as well as some older Arab and other Muslim graduate students, by older I mean mid to late 20s, uh, who may be taking one or two courses or doing independent study and have time for activism that, that few Jewish students can afford. The typical non-Jew, non-Muslim has little motivation to delve into this issue and may adopt an anti-Israel stance based on minimal, even incorrect understanding of the conflict. 
um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with many of these distortions. Just one example, you hear frequently that Gaza is occupied with a devastating Israeli blockade. Well, as you, as most of you know, that ignores Israel's 2005 withdrawal from Gaza, its contemporary provision of truckloads of goods for Gaza residents, and the blockade there limited to weapons and uh, associated materiel. What's more, there's a much stronger Muslim than Jewish uh, self-promotion ethic, even on issues unrelated to Israel. For example, both Jews and Muslims have been minority students at Roman Catholic colleges in the United States. Athletic teams at these colleges, as well as Catholic high schools, often use the nickname Crusaders, which is offensive to both Muslims and Jews, offensive to Muslims because of the conflict in the Middle East several centuries ago, in which both sides' participation was at least understandable by medieval standards, also offensive to Jews who were the victims of murder by crusaders and route from Europe to the, to the Holy Land. Uh, Jews had done nothing to provoke this. They were just considered infidels that the crusaders could attack on the way. But despite the stronger argument for Jewish revulsion against crusaders and a longer history of Jewish attendance at Catholic colleges, it has been Muslims, not Jews, who successfully forced the removal of the crusader nickname from many Roman Catholic college teams. Now, as to why there's a pervasive anti-Israel attitude in many venues, especially college campuses, I point to five perceived characteristics of Israel, disfavored by many opinion shapers who, who lecture on campuses and report in mainstream publications. First, Israel's a strong American ally, and to the extent traditional America is disfavored, so are its partners. Second, the Jews seen in the West are predominantly white, and the Arabs brown-skinned people of color. So the presumption that many whites are racist and people of color their victims redounds in favor of the Palestinians and against the Israelis. The black Ethiopian and brown Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews are not seen much in the West or, and are conveniently ignored. Third, the Israelis are wealthier than the Palestinians and some people are suspicious of wealth for many reasons, including a presumption that wealth is Unfair, unfairly attained by uh, colonialism, conquest, political favoritism, unfair inheritance, exploitation of labor. And in Israel's case, you'll hear a disproportionate emphasis on German reparations and American aid as the source of Israeli wealth rather than the entrepreneurship. Fourth, Zionism is of course a form of nationalism. It's at odds with fashionable globalization. An incorrect presumption a common incorrect presumption is that national pride inevitably involves imperialism and colonialism. It doesn't have to. You can have the national pride alone without the others, but that works to Israel's disadvantage. And fifth, Israelis are having more than enough children to increase Israel's population, in contrast to virtually every other Western country where family size is insufficient to maintain the population. Now, there are many reasons why individuals do or do not have children or if they do have children, have the number they do, but a society with large families is thereby expressing optimism and a future orientation. Societies with few children may include many who fear bringing babies into a world facing future devastation by climate change, nuclear war, other catastrophes, I guess I should add viruses uh, today, or uh, people may believe that their culture is simply not worth maintaining into future generations. So these are five reasons I suggest for prevailing anti-Israel animus that affects Jews as, as well. Now our second question of strongly identified Jews, those practicing Judaism with substantial Jewish education who have lived or live now in Israel, even IDF veterans, um, why would they adopt anti-Israel perspective? This has been less explored. And I suggest, emphasis on suggest, because you never really know what's motivating people, several religious, cultural, and psychological reasons for this anti-Israel orientation that's baffling and troubling to many Jews. And these are intrinsically Jewish characteristics. Each of these reasons I'm going to discuss fits some, but not all Jews, and some Jews are affected by many of them. Uh, first, I'll turn to the religion, the religious aspects. Some religious Jews, 
interpret attacks on Jews as divine punishment for Jews' own ethical lapses. For example, hatred among Jews is often cited as a reason for the destruction of the Second Temple. Others would point to Israelis not being sufficiently observant as the reason for the hostility they face. Now, such extreme self-criticism and inward focus exculpates Israel's enemies who are regarded as agents of deserved retribution against wayward Jews. I've heard many drashes on this, even to the point of uh, blaming the Holocaust on, on some Jews who weren't sufficiently observant. So again, this is an example, something that is held by some people, but not necessarily many. Second religious point is, if you interpret Isaiah's admonition to be a light unto the nations as a precept for general Jewish behavior, rather than a guide for Isaiah himself or other prophets, this implies stricter standards on the behavior of Israel and relative leniency for Israel's enemies. So again, there kind of biases the arguments in favor of the anti-Israel point of view. Third, over-publicizes a very small number of Orthodox Jews who believe that the modern rebirth of the state of Israel without the rebuilding of the ancient temple was an illegitimate affront to the divine plan. And these Jews have provided invaluable anti-Israel propaganda as evidence that seriously committed Jews do not favor Israel. They appear disproportionately in photos of protests and demonstrations. There may only be a few of them, but they seem to attract the photographers. Fourth, a combined religious cultural phenomenon is a long tradition of Jewish argumentation, centuries of Talmudic scholars admitting disparate and contrary viewpoints for consideration. This has been transmuted in modern times to secular study and unusual open-mindedness among Jews for hostile viewpoints. So let's turn to some Jewish cultural factors that tend to nurture support for the Palestinians and thereby vitiate pro-Israel positions. First, a uh, concomitant of the Jewish long-standing emphasis on education is exposure to modern secular study. That's uh, the transmutation in modern times. Modern secular study emphasizes tolerance of other views, respect for multicultural perspectives. It privileges even outlandish narratives over objective truth, which it's always suspicious of, and it accepts imprecision of language. If I said to you, I'm speaking today from the planet Mars, rather than my home outside Washington, D.C., instead of saying that's nuts, the prevailing academic view would say, tolerate that point of view, examine the framework he's coming from. Maybe he doesn't mean literally to planet Mars, maybe he's speaking figuratively. Um, so, you know, there's, there's more tolerance for that than there might have been in the past. And in general, blatant false revisions of history are accorded respect, considered reasonable alternatives. Furthermore, the genocidal threats to Israel from the Islamic Republic of Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, and others are conveniently interpreted as hyperbole, not taken literally. And the tendency to avoid judgment that's uh, induced by multicultural and relative perspectives leads, leads some to characterize both terrorism and defense against terrorism simply as part of a cycle of violence, thereby equating the arsonist and the, and the firefighter. Now, um, a second Jewish cultural feature is concern for other peoples, exemplified by prominent Israeli first responders to disasters all over the world, and the disproportionate American Jewish participation in the 1960s civil rights movement. And of course, sympathy for the plight of the Palestinians can compromise pro-Israel sentiment. Third, a common Jewish response to anti-Semitism has been to emphasize a universalism that would erase ethnic distinctions in contrast to the particularism which is inherent in supporting a Jewish state. And uh, ra related to this is, is categorizing Jews simply as adherents to a religion rather than a people or a nation. The, the initial reformed Jewish movement traditionally downplayed Jewish peoplehood in favor of Jews being characterized as for example, Germans of the Mosaic persuasion. Fourth, Jews, at least those in the West, are regarded as well-educated, wealthy, and overprivileged whites who should not have the temerity to complain about maltreatment in general or anti-Israel arguments in particular. 
And uh, so these are some of the cultural factors. Finally, there are psychological factors. Many Jews have been reticent in the face of any anti-Semitism, not merely that against Israel, in fear that further discussion will only exacerbate existing problems and foster additional hostility. Um, simple denial of anti-Jewish sentiment is another common psychological response. The ostrich uh, figuratively burying its, hand, its head in the sand. Academic psychology adds further insight. The ambivalence amplification theory implies that Jews will fit in better in the wider society by minimizing connection with Israel. And psychiatrist Kenneth Levin, who will be speaking next in the ZOA book series, has argued in the Oslo Syndrome that Jews, right, good, great book, that Jews have much in common with abused children, just as abused children blame their own behavior rather than that of their dysfunctional parents, some Jews believe they're at fault and uh, with sufficient flexibility, self-effacement and concessions, even with nothing from the, other, from the other side, Israel alone can resolve the conflict with its, with its neighbors. Now, I have no empirical evidence on the strength of these various factors I've outlined and I'm merely suggesting not proving anything about Jews being receptive to anti-Israel perspectives. At any rate, I'd be happy to take questions on my remarks or any other topics presented in my book or any other issues. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, there is, by the way, there is a um, function for raising your hand online. Um, so if you have questions, please do the online um, hand raising if you can. Um, does everybody know how to do that? Uh, you go into where it says participants at the bottom of your screen, and then you can click on uh, hand raise raise hand. Um, do we have any questions? <coughs> any any anybody? Oh, um, who's it, who's this? Abe Topio. Abe, you have the floor. Abe. There. Okay. Can can I be heard? Yes. 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 Please. I don't, I see share screen, record reaction, reactions. I can hear you, so. We can, we can hear, hear you, go ahead. Uh, okay, no, the last last point I was most interested in, uh, the other ones are, you know, not obvious, but obvious. Uh, a lot of people think has to do with sort of a self-hate, which I always consider this to be, you know, wanting to fit in, denial, and then that brought up when you said abused children sort of syndrome. Uh, it seems to me a lot of this is basically, I just want to fit in. I'm just like you. I, I, I you know, I dislike Israel because of a, a certain self-hate, because they're brought up without any real link to what it means to be Jewish. Well, that could be. I mean, there are people who are of Jewish ancestry with no other um, uh, Jewish element in their life, and they're susceptible to the anti-Israel arguments, the general ones I gave at the outset. There are cultural and religious as well as psychological reasons why even strongly identified Jews might be somewhat tepid in their support of Israel, or even adopt the uh, pro-Palestinian point of view, even to the point of protesting uh, and demonstrating in, in favor of the Palestinians. So, um, you are, have identified one element of, the, of, of Jews who uh, are not comfortable with their Jewish background or want to reject it, but um, and, and that's certainly part of it, but I also wanted to note that some uh, this is identified Jewish, Jewish, uh, Jewish identity, identity are, uh, uh, are similarly can be anti-Israel for a variety of reasons, including very religious people, for the first four reasons I, I mentioned. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'd like um, to talk. Um, okay, next, uh, uh, Neil Sussman. Thank you. Uh, I will posit that the Crusaders were the good guys, and that is because the Muslim attacks against uh, uh, the uh, Christian uh, communities was uh, constant and uh, ferocious, and that was they took over Syria, which was a Christian country. They attacked. Uh, the uh, Constantinople on a regular basis. They uh, attacked, uh, they made the Mediterranean a Muslim sea and attacked the ports throughout uh, Southern Europe. Uh, had uh, an arrangement with the Vikings in which the Vikings would attack the uh, Northern European 
courts take the women and sell them to uh, Muslim uh, peoples and rulers, and the the Crusades was an attempt to uh, protect Europe from the Muslim hordes. Well, I, I, that's certainly a point of view. Actually, I would agree with. It's not the point of view the Muslims would agree with. So I was just mentioning that it was it was offensive to them, and certainly there's no uh, pro Crusader argument to um, support what they did to the Jewish communities en route to right. the Holy Land. But actually, you remind me, your remarks remind me of the book, The Sword and the Scimitar by Raymond Ibrahim, which uh, goes into many uh, conflicts between Muslims and others. That's a good point. All Thanks. right, good, good point. Uh, next, we have um, M.H. Lazarson. M.H. Lazarson? Yeah, so wait a minute. Um, okay, fine. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, Professor Block, I uh, I agree with, of course, your many of your comments and, and insights, but I was wondering if you have any insights and understanding how the other side looks at Jews. For example, you gave many examples of Jewish timidity, uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish resistance to any sense of belonging to the Jewish people, uh, yet, most non-Jews looking in at the Jewish community and the Jews and also Jewish support for Israel sees a monolithic block of, of loyal Jews who are prickly whenever any criticisms are made of Israel. They, it's widely said throughout the media that uh, Jews brook no um, acceptance or tolerance of criticism of Israel. How, how do you see this double, this double-sided coin. On the one side, looking in from Jews, we see lots of Jews who have almost don't want to have any connection with our people, who, who are highly critical of Israel, who shrink from defending their basic rights, even as American citizens. And on the other hand, we see non-Jews seeing, Jew, seeing us as a, a really strong, united people, always def highly defensive. OK, good question. Well, I'm not Whoa. sure. I'm not I'm not sure that uh, all non-Jews see Jews this way. In fact, there's a, um, I've heard on college campuses, for example, that uh, people will try to find out if a, a Jewish student is a Zionist or just a ordinary Jew, as it were, the former being objectionable and the latter being acceptable. So, um, and I also think, I thought where your remarks might be going is that uh, since Jews are, at least in the Western Hemisphere, predominantly white, generally well-educated and wealthy, that it would be um, hard for others to imagine that they might be victims of hostility. But um, I, I don't know that I, you know, I, I guess the groups like the ZOA who uh, support Israel are, if, if your point of view is, is widespread, then they're doing a good job by promoting uh, an anti a pro-Israel attitude. And the anti-Israel people are, are quieter, but um, I'm not sure. There are plenty of organizations that are supposedly Jewish, but quite uh, tepid in their support of Israel, or even contrary to that. Well, See, perhaps. Um, uh, okay, wait, 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 we have to give other people a chance now. Um, Mort, did you want to ask a question? Mort? Uh, my question is that um, among the religious communities... Wait, who's speaking now? Can you hear me? That, yes, I can hear you. Okay, among the Orthodox uh, communities, we find a very good uh, relationship between Jews and Israel, much better than we do in the Reform or Conservative. In education, I think, I wonder, like you have so many professors, Jewish professors are anti-Israel, and are they because of education? or are they because of uh, the particular field they're interested in? For example, the Jews, um, the people educated as doctors or lawyers or engineers have a lower, um, uh, have a, uh, a lower uh, anti-Semitic feeling than, than uh, Jews of the more liberal uh, science. So you have sciences, you have religion, and you have education. How do you relate that to uh, anti-Semitism? Well, probably uh, if you look at the courses some of those people would have taken as students, 
they huh. would not have dealt with um, you know, historical and uh, sociological issues of the type that we've been discussing, well, and they um, simply would not have been exposed to th these issues. Uh, Susan mentioned last, Susan Tuckman mentioned last night that even in uh, courses in English composition, sometimes anti-Israel sentiments get uh, uh, inserted if, by choice of topics that the students are supposed to write on. So I, I would simply say that there's a limited amount of time people have, and if you're studying chemistry instead of history, you're not going to get into topics where um, discussion of Israel would be relevant. That's one point. On the Orthodox, I would say uh, what occurs to me there is I mentioned this, this uh, uh, ambivalence amplification theory. The Orthodox typically live in Orthodox neighborhoods where many, if not almost all of their contact with other Jews. So they don't have to compromise their Jewish identity to fit in better with their immediate community. Their immediate community is, is already heavily Jewish and supportive of Israel. So one could almost make the other argument that in an Orthodox community, they'd have to watch out for expressing an anti-Israel view. Um, that of course excludes the, some of the religious Jews that I mentioned earlier, who believe that the founding of the state of Israel was illegitimate because it did not, it did not occur with, uh, um, you know, it did not occur according to the divine plan. But that's just my suggestion to address your issues as to why the pro and anti-Israel sentiment varies across segments of the Jewish community. Um, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to, to uh, Mort, I Mort, Mort, uh, Mort, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Frau, for that really fabulous uh, discussion and explication. Thank you. Um, in, my, uh, in, in my experience with fellow Jewish organizations, <laughs> they seem to, to be extremely sympathetic to the Palestinian Arabs, the Arab cause. They almost never condemn Abbas and his horrific policies of actually paying Arabs to murder Jews, honoring terrorists. It's so grotesque. I came to the conclusion, <laughs> do you think it's possible that this is because after thousands of years of persecution against Jews, hatred, pogroms, holocausts, that a, a chunk of Jews have become so frightened of our enemies and those who hate us that they feel much more comfortable if they say, we are with you, Israel is a problem, don't hate me, don't kill me, that, that it's really out of fear as much as any other reason, uh, it's beyond ideology, that many Jews seem to uh, take on the Arab cause and condemn Israel's policies. Do you think there's a possibility that that's a factor? It's certainly a possibility. Again, as I, I've said, I don't know uh, empirically how important some of these uh, explanations are to how many people they apply, but your point is, is certainly a possibility that uh, it, it, is, uh, it is fear. I mean, I would think that with the, the strength of the IDF, that might be vitiated today, but on the other hand, more your comment could refer to American Jews simply taking positions uh, in college discussions or uh, conversations with their peers, and so the strength of the IDF would be irrelevant, and they they still would be scared to uh, uh, object to some of the things that the uh, other side is doing. So I, I think you have a another point that I didn't include that could be uh, relevant in many cases. I just again I can't. I don't think anybody can talk about how often the various explanations obtain for different people. It's a hard thing to do. Thank you. Okay. Thanks Thank so you. much, more. Thanks so much, more. Next, we have um, Robert Spiltalnik, and we have a, quite a lineup of uh, people um, uh, who who have their hands up right now. So, just want to let everybody know that, so that you know, people can keep their comments relatively brief. If you know, I, I don't want to stop anybody from saying whatever they'd like, but you know, we just have to give everybody a chance. Uh, Robert, go, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Liz. Um, so, Professor Block, it was very interesting that you to hear your analysis in terms of religious, cultural, and psychological uh, elements. I'm wondering if you could suggest. One, uh, one thing, if you had to, uh, as a remedy for this problem, um, and my own suggestion would be uh, a strengthening of Jewish education. Um, and I would cite um, as a uh, case in point um, in, in re with respect to Israel, that in the United States, 
Jews have such a lack of identity that only, I think, about 35% have even been to Israel compared with other countries like... It's 20%. It's 20%. 20%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, birthright, birthright may have some success, although it's only reaching a limited number of people. But you have Jewish education is weak, and then secular education is weak, and they turn to a concept like tikkun olam, where they have to defend every weak person in the world and not the Jews. Would, would, the, would you agree with what I'm suggesting as, a, as a, uh, perhaps a prime remedy? Well, I, I, I think it, had, it would have some remedial effect. The problem is how do you motivate people to get that education if they haven't had it? You know, how do you motivate a college student to, take, uh, to study on their own? If they take a course, it's likely to be uh, taught by a, an Arab who's funded by Middle Eastern money. So they're not going to get perspective that uh, would be uh, friendly to Israel. Um, uh, you know, and, and many would say, look, I don't care that much about it. I'm an American. I want to study this and that. It's a course on Israel or a lecture on Israel. I'm simply not interested. So how, how you motivate that is, is a big problem. Hmm. But I, if, if you could get people in a classroom or to read the right books, I'm, it would have the effect that you, you hope for, and I hope for many here. Too, I, would think it would, I would think it would need to begin a lot earlier than that. Yeah. Well, if their parents don't think it's important and they go to public school and many kids have, don't even have a bar bat mitzvah today, uh, they have very little Jewish education of any kind. So if it's not important to the parents, the kids aren't going to get it. Um, Mort, did you want to add something to that? Mort. Um, <clears throat> well, I just, I, I, I would simply want to add that uh, education is a big is a big factor. The Jews do not know the details, the reality of the Arab war against Israel. And I really believe this, as well as our secular media, the Jewish media doesn't have articles about Arabs glorifying terrorists, about naming school streets and sports teams after terrorists. There's like 75 school streets and sports teams and children's camps named after Jew killing terrorists. They don't talk about the, you know, the Abbas's spending millions of dollars paying Arabs to murder Jews, lifetime pensions. Uh, I really blame our Jewish media. You will not learn the horrors of the Arab Islamic war against Israel if you just read uh, newspapers, even Jewish papers. So our Jewish media should be all over this. Look, the Arab papers lie against Israel relentlessly. So if you read that, those papers, you'll learn to hate Israel based on lies. You read the Jewish papers, you won't learn the truth. And so I, I think it's really a flaw in our own situation and our Jewish organizations. Our Jewish organizations, you know, you know uh, even promoting a Palestinian state, despite the fact that they're a bunch of terrorists, uh, really sends a message that they're, they're okay. If they're, because if they weren't okay, why would we want to support a Palestinian state? And yet every Jewish group, virtually everyone except ZOA, publicly supports a Palestinian state. And uh, I really blame our people, our media, for the problem of not educating Jews and others about the reality and the truth of the Arab Islamic war against Israel. Yeah, I, I, I discuss it in a different section of the book, uh, terrorism in general, but with many applications to uh, Israel uh, along the lines of what was suggesting. And it's, it's very interesting that the incentives that the Palestinian Authority promote, can, it can be argued it increases terrorism. Take a, a, a suicidal person, suicidal Arab, if the Arab go, the, kills himself, there's no honor to that in, in the Arab Palestinian community. Uh, but if, the, if he goes out and kills Israelis and gets shot by uh, Israeli police in the course of that, he will be regarded as a martyr. His family will be uh, rewarded financially and schools and streets, as Morton noted, well, it could be a school or street could be named after him. So the honor he'll bring to his family is higher if he tries, to, uh, if he looks to achieve his own death by attacking an Israeli and hopes for a response rather than simply committing suicide. So they, and these, these amounts are very generous. You know, if you look at the maximum amount, an American who uh, has worked all his life, his or her life, and delays receiving Social Security till age 70, that's about 3,500, a little more a year, the maximum you can get, that's what an Arab will get for murdering a Jew. A month, that's a lot of money in that society. Month, a month, you mean? A month, yeah. Yeah, a month, a month. Yeah, yeah. a month. Um, and by the way, let me just say, I can, proof of what I'm saying that has validity, I speak at reform synagogues all the time and conservative. They're generally left-wing. When I finish my speeches telling the reality of what's really going on, 
I get standing ovations virtually every single speech from Reform Jews and conservative Jews. And they come over to me saying they never heard of any of these things. Wow. They're not educated. If they understood the truth, they would not be left-wing Jews saying make every concession to this terrorist regime. The Jewish groups, our educational system, our media do not educate our own people. As I said, the, to me the proof is I get standing ovations when they learn the truth. Yeah, I, 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 um, yeah, I, I just want, I mean, this is a very well-educated uh, group here nice today. And how, many peop how many people here even know that there was an attack, this uh, ramming attack this week where uh, you know, mm -hmm. Palestinian Arab, you know, jumped a curb and, 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 and ran into, uh, you know, a soldier and then jumped out of his car and started stabbing him. How many people even heard about that? I, I heard about it right up close in front. Yeah, but, you know, how many people from in, Amer in America have heard about it? A lot I, of people here in this, very well -educated, in this very well-educated group have, hadn't even heard about that attack. And, you know, it's, I heard about it. <laughs> okay, great. Stopping the attack at Teddy Stadium. I heard about it. Okay, good. In our seven, they reported it. That's a select audience. Oh, good. I'm glad we have. Your point, your point is well taken. I go to the Israeli papers online, yeah. and that's how I hear about it. Yeah, right. But, but you, everybody's you, online, and every so people who who pay attention have heard about it. Right. I have hundreds of friends in hundreds of groups about Israel. But your point is well taken. Most mainstream people do not. Right. I have a comment. Okay. Um, I, next, let me, let me just go through the line. Um, well, well, let me, uh, Stephen Yosun, who hasn't made a comment in previous uh, uh, book group, uh, book club uh, meetings. Steve Yosun. Hi. Hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, hi. Hi, Farrell. I see. So, um, as I was listening to a number of the comments, I've been uh, catching up, now that we're sheltered in place in most locations, with some of the streaming um, series that I haven't seen before, and I had never watched Fauda. I wonder if you looked at it, and I wonder what your take is on how they represent the conflict um, and presenting points of view. If you, and if you're not familiar with the series, just pass on to the next question. But I'd be interested if you watched any of it, how you regard it. Because it's very, it's very popular in Israel. I guess it's very popular among some American Jews now. And I understand that it also has some popularity um, among some Arab groups in the Middle East as well. I, yeah, we hear, I hear that Hamas watches it. <laughs> anyway, uh, Farrell, please. <laughs> I, I don't know enough about it to come, and maybe someone else does. Um, well, maybe we'll go, we'll go on to the next question. Um, but thank you for that. Um, Julia Lutch. Is Julia, Julia there? Can you hear me? Yeah, very uh, faintly. Please, please speak louder. Can you hear me now? I Much can. better. Much better. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, develop further the issue of the failure of education. It seems to me that um, most rabbis that, I've gone to different shuls because I drive around a lot, and most rabbis in the conservative and reform shuls I visited tend to take a uh, universalist point of view and uh, relate anything in their droshes to um, tikkun olam. In other words, uh, everything uh, from the preceding 4,000 years is thrown away and all we have is this particular point of view. But most important, I think the failure of Jewish education starts in the home. If you don't read your kids uh, on a steady basis, Jewish storybooks when they grow up, and there's all sorts of marvelous storybooks. If you don't teach them two or three Jewish songs for each holiday, if you don't celebrate the holidays in your home, they're going to see it as something they're forced to do, Jewish religious school, because their parents will look bad in the community if they don't attend. If it isn't built into the heart of the home, it isn't going to take. Could you please comment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, th that makes sense to me. The, the problem is when you start out with parents who aren't particularly motivated to do that, it, it doesn't start up at all. And, um, um, you know, it's a great idea of, of uh, a well-meaning parent who wanted to inculcate a Jewish identity and their children uh, asked for that advice and they followed it. That's wonderful. The problem is a lot of them don't care about it. And so they won't bother with it. And I don't know how you get to that point. Okay. Because they weren't um, brought up with it. 
So. Uh, Jay Homnick, um, uh, by the way, um, what I'm trying to do is, is get people, uh, give, give people an opportunity who didn't yeah, speak on previous. Uh, yeah, I, I will, I will. Oh, no, no, you, you weren't up yet. Uh, Jay Homnick now. Hi, first of all, thank you for the beautiful, lucid presentation. Uh, you don't you. often hear the word vitiate and uh, uh, <laughs> concomitant uh, in, in a jargon-free presentation, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, for, for a writer, it's very soothing <laughs> in times of quarantine, just to hear words like that. Um, but my, my concern is that what ends up happening is we, we force into a kind of a multi-pronged war, and I don't know how we go about conducting it. I don't see any magic bullet. You know, if, if we accept your analysis, then what happens is that in the uh, Marxist kind of wealth-based world, so the, the Jews are the rich guys, they're the bad guys. In the, in the racism world, the Jews are the white. And, you know, in the in the, among the religious, there's a, another front that would, that's religious based, uh, even if it's a, a a small minority. And so, you know, how do you fight this multi-front battle? Uh, it, it, this coming at it from a lot of sides. Yeah, a lot of these questions are are kind of uh, about how you would repair some of the uh, issues that I mentioned and. I have no particular expertise in that. I'm not, you know, involved in uh, in, in in this as much as as more than many uh, ZOA people are. Many people in, in this present, you know, many people in the audience today. So I have a, a very limited idea of of what to do. I was interested in hearing Susan Tuckman last night because she's, you know, on the front lines with this. But I I I don't know what to say other than I. I wish it would happen. I recognize the difficulty of the situation you're you're uh, describing, but um, other than hoping it ameliorates in some way, I don't know what to what to uh, what to say. You know. And I, I think that a lot of uh, what ZOA does is just you know constantly bang away on the truth, you know, and all and all these issues. <laughs> um, and, and more, I think maybe more can speak to that too. I mean, it, that's the the best. Uh, I mean, the, the biggest problem we have is, is lies about Israel and the, can, the way to counteract that is to get the truth out there as much as possible. Mort? Uh, no, let, let, let's give other people a chance. Okay. Um, uh, Peter Zimmerman? Peter Zimmerman? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, good. So can you comment on um, powerful Jewish politicians in the Democratic <clears throat> Party, uh, Jewish ownership in the mainstream media and, and New York Times, CNN has Jewish uh, hosts, and yet uh, they don't seem to be supportive of Israel, at least that's my impression. And, and to what extent do you think the polarization of American politics and the election of Trump and has, has aggravated or affected the whole situation? Well, the people you mentioned in the media have a weak Jewish identity, so they would tend to adopt the anti-Israel arguments that I mentioned at the beginning that are pervasive, which I call the, the triumph of the pro-Palestinian narrative. <clears throat> I think that explains it. They don't have any counter Jewish viewpoint uh, to, to uh, over, overcome that, and that is the predominant campus view and perhaps uh, mainstream media view. Um, with uh, the polarization, um, we definitely are having additional polarization, but I don't view that, I mean, there's a, there's a derivative effect on, on Israel there, but it, it doesn't seem to be the, the primary issue with the uh, Democrat versus Republican uh, polarization. The, the thing that occurs to me is, and I, I write this in the book on another part of it, that Jews are about the only group who could go to a demonstration and be hated by both sides. If you think about the Charlottesville uh, demonstration in 2017, you had on the one side, or 2018, I'm sorry, you had on, on one side uh, white supremacists who were clearly anti-Semitic, for whom Jews are not white enough. And on the other side, you had a lot of Antifa people for whom a, an anti-Israel position is part and parcel of their general political framework. So to be a Jew there, you don't know what side of the street to walk on. And when I think of bifurcation society, sometimes I feel the Jews are the only group that doesn't fit in either place. 
Thank Just you. one quick thing. Um, Does I'm Trump's more... support of Israel have any effect on any of this? Well, it should uh, make <laughs> it should make people who are supportive of Israel more supportive of Trump, and people who are not um, more supportive of people who would run against him. I would, I would, you know, say that. Um, That's uh, not necessarily you know. true, though, because people who hate Trump are so deranged that they can't even accept when he does something good, and they come up with, but his his uh, he's not doing it for us; he's doing it for votes. There's such derangement in the Jewish population now that it doesn't matter what that man does, they will vilify him and make excuses against him. Okay, thank you. Who is, who is that? Oh, there, um, My name's D. Oh, D. Okay, great. Thank you for that comment. Um, then I guess next is, um, do we have Marty Zukov speak yet? Marty Zukov? Yeah, hi, I'm here. <clears throat> okay. A follow up on uh, Mort's comments about uh, the reform movement and two part question. Would you agree that the, they're the most dangerous group in America as far as the American Jewish community? And why, when they have approximately a thousand rabbis on their rabbinic cabinet, they're sure, certainly not, I don't think they're short of the knowledge. So, besides requiring Mort to visit, and speak at every reform center <laughs> in the country. What else can we could do to combat this J Street, uh, J Street virus? <laughs> Mort, did you did you want to? Okay, this, this is really uh, uh, Farrow Block's time. It's not mine. I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to respond. Well, I, I would just defer to you or other people here because again, this is an issue of activism. I mean, what I've done in the book is talk about the the issues. I, I don't have the, the uh, kind of experience that ZOA has on the ground doing this. I mean, I've had minimal political activity, but not a lot. And so I don't know, you know, what the contemporary campus is like, the different viewpoints, how to get through to different people, who's on which side, and I just don't have the background. So I, I, I'm at a loss to say much about how one can counteract some of these issues. <laughs> I mean, one thing, of course, is to join ZOA, strengthen us, and give us more influence. If we, have, if we were bigger and stronger, we'd have more influence to offset uh, the extremist left-wing views of the leaders of the reform movement and other and leaders of other movements, such as Hayas and uh, Peace Now and Amenu and such. Thank you so much. Um, <coughs> we have um, Ron Warren. Ron Warren? Is Ron Warren there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I uh, wanted to uh, sort of ratify what Mort had said. Uh, I used to be um, a conservative Jew and lived in a neighborhood of conservative Jews. And when I was about 40, I moved to uh, an Orthodox uh, perspective and then later on moved to near where Mort lives. And my experience was the ignorance was among the center of gravity of the J Jewish people in the conservative movement and how much more so in the reform movement, is very, very low in knowledge. And these people uh, with a self-esteem movement hold themselves in high esteem. After all, they have very high levels of education. So, I mean, I used to get into discussions with them and I would ask them, well, uh, let me ask you a question is the book of Ezekiel in the New Testament or the Old Testament? <laughs> and the truth of the matter is that only about half of the people would respond correctly. It's, it's shocking. And then I would say the people who would really think, oh, I got him on this one. I'd say, well, tell me, who is Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi? Ah, very few people, only a, a couple of people, and they had gone to day school as children, knew who, who. now here's the, the, the author of the Mishnah and the president of the Jewish people and, and really the, the person who took, made us what we are now as Jews, they don't know. So they have no concept that we have a role in the history of the world, which is very, very central to the meaning and identity of the whole world. And they're, what, they're afraid of something like this. This is a tremendous burden to be a Jewish and to be knowledgeable of that role. Well, thank, I thank to you. Know thank what you. What your opinion is on that? Thank you. Excellent comments. 
Well, I mean, I, I agree with your what you're saying uh, that uh, you know there is uh, a tremendous lack of education, and and uh, in particular on the recent history in Israel, uh, and even there's uh, there are several fallacies that are very common that people in this audience are probably familiar with it, that others aren't. I mean, one I'll just I mentioned one about Gaza initially, but the idea that there was a lot of immigration into the area from Egypt and Syria in the 20th is, is not known. And the fact that there are a lot of Jews living there longer term is unknown. The presumption, the, the common narrative tells you that these Arabs were living there forever and the Jews were interlopers. Uh, the UNRWA, the uh, refugee agency that supports specifically uh, Palestinian Arabs, has a stipulation in there that anyone who is living in Israel who, who came to that area as late as 1946 is entitled to be a refugee or their descendants. So it, it uh, indicates that even a recent, there were a lot of recent Arab immigrants who came there from Egypt and Syria as a, uh, perhaps as a result of uh, the Jews building up the land. I mean, prominent uh, Arabs, about prominent Palestinian Arabs, you have um, Arafat was born in Egypt, uh, uh, and uh, Abbas's parents were born in Syria, and and uh, you know you just trace a lot of them. It, it's they're not long-term residents, as uh, there are some, but many were not. Thank you. Um, next, um, Linda Linda Cohn. Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Good. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of pro-Israel talking points with other Zionist activists, if you ever have a, the opportunity of, of debating the other side. So my first point that I like to make is, I believe in cultural self-determination for all the world's people, including my own, the Jews, in our ancestral homeland, Israel, with Jerusalem as its capital. If you believe in cultural self-determination for all the world's people, except the Jews, you're a Bigot. And then, of course, they come up and say, what about the Palestinians? And then you go into the, um, okay, what about the Palestinians? Good question. Palestine is the name of a territory that was part of the British Empire. Before that, it was a territory that was part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Before that, it was a territory that was part of the Roman Empire. Before that, it was the sovereign nation of Israel. When Palestine was a territory that was part of the British Empire, the British cut off approximately 75% of it and created the nation of Transjordan, which later became Jordan. So 75% of historical Palestine is today today's Jordan. That's your Palestinian homeland. So that's my first argument that I wanted to share. And the other argument is when they say Palestinians are the indigenous population, I say no. Arabs are indigenous to Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. That's where they get their name from. Jews are indigenous to Judea. That's where we get our name from. Judea is located in what today is called the West Bank, currently occupied by the Palestinian Authority. So those are the arguments I make um, to Excellent. the other side. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. Um, did, did you want to? Um, well, there are there are a lot of arguments like that. Also, for example, there was no protest between 1948 and 1967 when Egypt occupied Gaza and Jordan occupied the West Bank. No, you didn't hear anything about a Palestinian state. The PLO's charter talks about getting Israel, expunging Israel, destroying Israel. It doesn't talk about establishing a state in those two areas. So the idea was more to destroy Israel than to have a Palestinian state. If Egypt and Jordan kept those lands and, and somehow Israel was uh, destroyed, that would be fine. There wouldn't be any discussion about a Palestinian state because there wasn't any in those 19 years. And the PLO doesn't even mention it. They talk about just getting rid of Israel. I mean, I could give another talk on all the fallacies that are common in these arguments. It's in my book, but I, I don't want to get started with that. And some of them have been mentioned by uh, you all. So for now, and I, um, I think you're, a lot of you are quite familiar with some of those arguments anyway. Um, Mort, were, Mort, were you trying to comment? Or, or? No. No, okay. Uh, next we have, um, uh, was that, did we have Leonard Rothman yet? Leonard Rothman. Oh, you're muted. Hold on. I mean. I think we received you on a little bit thing. 
Can, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. And now we can hear you. Okay, I would like to address a point made by um, our speaker uh, 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 related to um, the uh, people who uh, feel that um, the the uh, the black people are, are the Arabs and favoring them versus the Jews who are white. Uh, what concerns me is that the last time I saw any evidence to me of Israel portraying itself as a uh, unbiased country uh, related to black relations was at, at the funeral of um, blocking the hero, military hero who was killed by the other, Mr. Goldstein. And um, there was a black um, uh, military policewoman who marched solitarily along with the others um, in the uh, funeral. Um, I was recently in Ethiopia and visited both uh, black Jewish communities. And uh, I feel that Israel does not portray itself um, as an unbiased country, and I'm not going to get into the reasons. I think a lot of people there don't care, but the point is, is that it seems to me that one way they could improve in 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 their relationship with uh, the uh, non-white communities in the United States is if there were more newscasters, more representatives uh, 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 of Israel in the United States who are of Ethiopian origin. I remember that when Begin came in the 70s and said uh, that he was invited to every Jewish organization in the country, he said, frankly, I'm going to visit the evangelical Christians because I know that there I will have no arguments. And, they will, and, and I think that he made a very, very good presentation and, and it helped for them to uh, tone down much of their rhetoric. So that's, what, what's your opinion? What, what can the Zionist organization do to encourage Israel to uh, improve its image in this direction, or do you think it's not really important? Well, I think it, it definitely could help. Again, uh, we're, it gets into the issue of activism and uh, um, you know political uh, presentation, which I don't feel particularly qualified to talk about and haven't been particularly experienced in. So, uh, you know, I, I I think that would certainly help quite a bit. Um, it's quite interesting to me that in America, particularly the, uh, I'm thinking of the Ferguson, Missouri issue, somehow Palestinians got involved with African Americans there and an issue which is intrinsically an issue of America, uh, the relationship between police and African Americans somehow got generalized to um, an anti-Israel uh, dimension somehow because they're the, the Palestinians or other Muslims have been very aggressive and very um, active in, in courting African-Americans. And um, th that's quite a, an interesting phenomenon because there are many uh, contrary, many discordances between African-Americans and Palestinians that seem to be uh, ignored in that apparent alliance. But I, I agree. I have seen some uh, Ethiopian Jews be, uh, publicized. I think there are there was a, uh, a pop singer. I can't remember the names. There may have been a Miss Israel who was Ethiopian. Uh, I just, I don't know, but it does happen. And I think you're right that uh, promoting such people would help more, but I, why it's not done or if it's done proportionally or not, I, I can't comment. I don't want to go there. I have my own opinions and I don't want to um, okay. start Thank now. you. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, next we have Ken Moskowitz. Okay, I made my comments. <laughs> Thanks. No, I'm just trying to give everybody. A ch I'm just trying to give everybody a chance. You know, so you know, I'm asking you know, if you can just make the comment once. It's going to be helpful. Thank you, um, Professor uh, Block. Your presentation was contemporary um, and modern, and I just wondered, from a historic perspective, has not the role of the Jew since the Roman conquest? been the canary in the coal mine scenario. Definitely, where, yeah. So that anything that we're members of ZOA, we did this activism today, but historically our fight is to be the opponent fighting for what's right. And ultimately, I'm not sure until the Messiah comes, there'll, there'll be a solution. 
just well, comment and on the general epic we're talking about as opposed to just the specifics of our time. yeah no you're you're right that, that the uh, the jews definitely have been a canary in the coal mine i have a whole chapter on the history of anti-semitism you know i couldn't talk about everything in today's presentation but uh, that's uh quite right and what's particularly alarming is how some um unfortunate um, stereotypes and attributions have lasted for centuries. You know, you had a blood libel from several hundred years ago that's still alive today where in the Arab world and even elsewhere, people believe that Jews need uh, Christian blood to make matzah. And the stuff of the current virus is really unbelievable. And I'm sure a lot are familiar with that. There's a, a lot of literature from all sides, the uh, white supremacists, the Muslims, saying that the Jews are responsible for the coronavirus, not only to destroy other societies, but also so that they will profit, their pharmaceutical companies will profit from any vaccines associated with it. So it's, it's quite amazing that uh, some, of the, some of the basic anti-Semitic themes have lasted for centuries. Uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Block, why don't you tell the audience again the name of your book and how people can purchase it? Okay, it's called Identity and Prejudice. It's on Amazon, uh, as are as virtually everything else. I have an unusual name, so you won't confuse me with anybody else. And uh, the, the best way to get it is simply go on Amazon mm -hmm. and order it the way you'd order this other is, books there. This is a copy of Thank it, everyone. You. Um, I guess next is Nelson Wolf, and then after that we'll have Michael Goldstein and Steve Feldman, and then I see some people have also been um, raising some questions on the online chat, so maybe I'll read some of those off after that. So uh, Nelson, please go ahead. Nelson? Oh, I would there, just, there. With, Presbyterian, with Presbyterian ministers, and I pointed out that all of the things that they hold dear were the antithesis of what the Palestinians stood for. And what they held dear is what Israel held dear. What I'm talking about is things like views towards homosexuality, uh, towards women's rights, uh, towards many of the things that they held dear. And I said I could not understand how they could fit this together with their posture. So my question really is, how does the Jew who supports the Palestinian fits this into their intersectionality, if you will, when all they stand for is the antithesis of what the Palestinians stand for, and all they stand for is what the Jews in Israel stand for, so could you answer that for me, yeah, please? Yeah, it's, it's very baffling to me. You have, uh, for example, gay Palestinians who escaped to Israel to avoid being uh, even murdered or at least imprisoned or tortured, and they're tolerated in Israel. Yet you will find uh, some gay groups favoring the Palestinians, even to the point of saying that what the Israelis are doing is what they call pinkwashing, i.e. Mm -hmm. giving the impression that they are uh, tolerant of gays simply to impress other people. I mean, the, the, the stretches are mind boggling. Uh, there was an essay, I might even have been a graduate school thesis written by an Israeli student arguing that it was racist of Israeli soldiers not to have raped Palestinian women in the course of the various conflicts. <laughs> they, so the Israelis got blamed for not doing that. <laughs> because it was regarded well, they were it would be like maybe uh, interacting with an animal or something in the Israeli mind, according to her thesis. So I mean, you you can't win. You know, doing something right gets twisted around. So you're either doing it to, um, you know, uh, give an impression that's misleading, or for the wrong reason. I, I share your bafflement. I don't know what to say about it, but I have seen this this inconsistency. Um, Michael Goldstein, please. Michael? Yeah, I had to unmute. Um, one of the big problems that we face is that most Jewish kids do not go to day, Jewish day school and Jewish high school. They go to the public school system. Um, public school system, K through 12, and going into higher education, is just completely 
um, filled with uh, materials, with curriculum, and specifically textbooks that are anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-Christian, and anti-American, and pro-Muslim, even if you just talk about the, the amount of material in each textbook. Um, I'm the uh, general counsel for proclaiming justice to the nations. We have a 120 page white paper on this and a podcast, a, a Zoom a meeting tonight, if you go to pjtn.org, on how the public schools are destroying uh, the constitutional republic. And a lot of it is on the backs of the Jews. And so uh, I can't remember which gentleman was talking about their um, a zillion fights, but at least he recognizes that they are fights. And the way to fight this is to get um, Jewish people who really know what's going on and Christians, especially evangelical Christians who know what's going on, get them on your local school boards. That's one fight we can win and we have won it in some uh, school districts around the country and we need to do a lot more because when the kids get to college, they've already been inculcated. See, that's one of the words the writers can use. They've already <laughs> been inculcated with um, anti-Jewish, anti-Israel material, even the Jewish kids. And I don't know, Dr. Block, if you're familiar with what is going on in K through 12. Um, well, I have- Working yeah. on legislation, I'm gonna talk to Susan about this. We talked a little bit last night about yeah. uh, working together on this. I'm familiar only to the extent that I've read articles about this. I think in California in particular, there are organizations that are inserting their textbooks with the biases you just outlined and being very successful at it. And there's some occasional uh, protest against it. I think what a lot of parents may do is they'll simply say, I'll take my kids out of public school and I'll go to private school, or they'll have some viewpoint that's more amenable to mine and they don't fight the, the public school battle. But you're, see, when I, when I mentioned that educators and journalists are primary opinion shapers, you're pointing out quite correctly that it's not just professors, it's high schools and elementary schools too. That's right. Um, thank you so much, Michael. Um, Steve Feldman, Steve is our uh, Philadelphia ZOA Executive Director. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and thank you, Professor Block, for your wonderful, uh, too concise for my taste presentation. I would <laughs> rather, I'd like to hear you for a whole hour, but thank you. Uh, you some, of these, some of what I want to ask you has been uh, addressed in the Q&A, but if we can't solve some of the problems you raised, how can we try to mitigate them or offset them so they're not as damaging? Well, I think the ZOA is doing a great, a great job. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a recent uh, proposal to, I mean, I see, I see ZOA letters by Mort and Susan constantly and others, and they, uh, they're great. I mean, I just wish there were more like you and not so many, uh, you know, people in the middle or the other side. But the ZOA is doing a fabulous job. I, I wish you would just magnify your efforts if you can. And, um, <laughs> I don't know why some of the other Jewish groups don't join you as well. They seem to be Jewish second or third with a, a different agenda for first or second often. Uh, maybe they don't want to criticize a certain politician because they like him or her. And, and that trumps, no pun intended, the, uh, the uh, uh, Jewish positions or Israel positions they may take. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough situation how to, how to counter that. But the I, I think the educators, you know, when, when you're dealing with educators who are uh, teaching kids and the kids come out of high school and get on college campuses already with certain viewpoints that they've had for their whole life, you're starting from behind right there. That's a, so education could be the key, especially now that it's diffused into elementary education. Okay, Thanks. thank you so much, Steve. Um, I'm going to read a couple of the online questions um, from the chat. Um, well, this, this isn't a question, but this is very interesting. Somebody, um, M. H. Lazarusen, wrote uh, that many Jewish day schools encourage students to condemn Israel. For example, at the Charles D. Smith Jewish Day School in D.C., they organized a protest against Israel at its embassy in Washington. Terrible. Uh, prote protesting Israel's tre supposed treatment of Arabs. Um, uh, does anybody have more information about that that you or Farrell, do you want to speak? Uh, to I just I saw one thing that's even more disgusting. There was a Jewish day school in London where I saw this on on YouTube, I think, where the kids 
Kaddish for Hamas oh, yeah. terrorists. I remember Unbelievable. That. Oh, terrible. So these wow. are examples of what, what Mark M. H. Lazerson and uh, what I just said are examples of strongly identified Jews. These are kids in day school. They know a lot about uh, Judaism, but they're still anti-Israel. So there's that element that you don't have to be someone who's uh, completely uh, alienated from Jewish life. You can have a very strong Jewish identity. I'm sure these kids at the school uh, just mentioned or the, in London know a lot about Jewish history and you know, they can probably speak Hebrew pretty well, etc. But nonetheless, they have these uh, these points of view. Mishigana, Mishigana views. Um, then, um, okay, Ronald Scheinson, this is also very interesting. He wrote, he writes, my great uncle was a Palestinian, an American Orthodox Jew. He made Aliyah in the 1920s when as, as an academic, he could not find a university position as he was a Jew. The local Arabs would curse him with uh, words, uh, words, words that you can say. They call them a pal <laughs> they were, they called him a Palestinian. In Israel, the whites are minority, needs to be publicized. Well, I, I, you know, what uh, my comment to that is uh, to Ronald would be that I, uh, if you have information about your your uncle's experience, uh, let's get that out there. If you can write up an article about it, um, you know, let us know. Um, one of the things we've tried to do at COA is collect some histories of people who are, you know, of, of Jews whose family families have been in Israel for a long time. I think I, I agree that that is a very important to do. Um, uh, Bar Farrell, you want to comment on that or? Um, well, yeah, a lot of stories don't get out. I think people are not aware of how much uh, Arab uh, resistance and uh, hostility there was to Jews. They don't know about the 1929 Hebron massacre. Uh, they don't know a lot of these things. Uh, and the more history that gets out, that, that could help. Okay, then Lib Sher Sher says, do you see possibilities in Zoom in changing the narrative? The universities are closed, and um, except for distance mm -hmm. teaching, and a good deal of our problems stems, stems from the universities. They're being closed may be a positive for us. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's reduced time uh, uh, associated with university. I know uh, kids in high school and uh, elementary school have shorter work, uh, shorter school days now than they did before. But again, it's the motivation of someone to seek out um, seminars online or YouTube videos or various programs. And, and if the motivation is not there, they won't receive the education. So again, the motivation is a big factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah um, Bob Gazzardi wrote a nice comment. Uh, Mort is right. I learned more in a five-minute conversation than all the media, both Jewish and non-Jewish. Um, okay, then let's see. Um, I don't know. There's so many great comments here. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we'll have time uh, for it. Oh, here's one. Look at Bernie Sanders is in bed with anti-Semites. Do you, do you want to comment on, on Bernie? Well, yeah, he and, and interestingly, in his youth, he apparently worked on a kibbutz. Um, uh -huh. But uh, again, his his political views are are more important. I mean, we spoke earlier about groups you'd expect to be allied with Israel, like uh, gay groups, and they're not. Um, you know, uh, despite the uh, the horrible treatment that gays have in the Palestinian society and acceptance in Israeli society. Um, same thing with uh, feminist groups. It's, it's really, really quite amazing. Now, um, I think that uh, someone like Bernie Sanders is not particularly well informed, and he probably accepts the anti-Israel narrative that I uh, outlined earlier. Before I got into the issue of strongly identified Jews being anti-Israel, I discussed why there is a, a general anti-Israel animus in society, and I. I think Bernie Sanders probably accepts that that narrative as flawed as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have um, Michael Miller says, um, there is too much focus on the tiny group of extremists who I call neurotic carta. <laughs> Good name for them. <laughs> they receive a disproportionate amount of media attention due to their views and to what I refer to as the Martian factor, the alien views and appearance. Uh, yeah, they do. Them. There are other uh, sects, uh, as I've heard, Satmars are, are particularly non-Zionist as well, but they're not as active as the Nure Karta uh, people. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, one of the problems with the bias in, uh, there's many ways, I have a whole section in the book on how journalism is biased, different ways it is. But one of them is, if you have a demonstration and there are hundreds of people on each side, and there are nine people, uh, Orthodox Jews, who are anti-Israel, they'll get a lot of photos, maybe the only photo uh, in, in the newspaper article. So um, they get a lot of publicity for such a small group. By the way, when we, uh, <laughs> it was funny, sort of funny story, well, they were, um, we, we, you know, ZOA worked on the uh, anti-Iran deal protests back in 2015. And I don't know if you remember it in New York, we got maybe about 15, 16,000 people out. It was really tremendous. And there was a small contingent from Uteroid Carta who was there. And uh, uh, this woman, um, you know, I, I don't remember her name, but <laughs> she told me that uh, the way she uh, got them to all turn around <laughs> was she went over in front of them and started flashing them. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> and they all turned around and and, <laughs> and stop, you know, so that their signs were no longer there. Yeah, there, there's bias in photography and headlines and uh, which stories are chosen, and of course, oh. or obviously, how stories are written up. So, plenty of opportunity for bias to present one oh. side of the story. We have um, another hand up, um, Perry Bergman. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I think we're headed in a, a deep hole here because uh, we, the, this left wing in the Democratic Party is, is very anti-Israel. Uh, we could see that it, when Congress couldn't even adopt the resolution saying that anti-Semitism is hatred despite all the statements of these people like Omar and Talib and people like that, the, the big concern is it's, it's, all, it's all about uh, uh, demographics. The Muslims are becoming more potent and the Jews, because of the stuff here that said, have become more impotent. So, Everything is that people have said is reflected now in our politics. And the only thing I can say is thank God for the evangelistic Christians who many of these same Jews criticize. Otherwise, we'd really be in trouble. That, that's you. true. Yeah. The, the, I mentioned with the, uh, the example of the Crusaders on Roman Catholic uh, campuses that uh, the Muslims are just stronger in terms of promoting themselves generally than, than the Jews are also. Jews are quiet, don't bother me, I've got other things I'm doing, whereas Muslims tend to be uh, more active and more self-promoting. So it's not simply the numbers, but it's the uh, activity within those communities too that's disadvantageous to Jews, at least at, at present. I mean, the, the ZOA is unfortunately not representative of most American Jews. Um, but um, the Muslims do have a, a stronger presence and more support for uh, pro-Muslim organizations, pro-Arab organizations. It's very rare to see a Muslim take a anti-Palestinian pro-Israeli view. It does happen, but the, the extent to which they would be um, and, you know, I tend to use the word excommunicated or, you know, in their community is, is a real threat. So I've seen comments on articles on the web where a Muslim will say something like, say he's embarrassed about terrorism or something, but you don't see the kind of um, support for Israel among Muslims that you see support for Palestinians among Jews. It's really, really asymmetric. There, there, there are few exceptions. There are hatred in early age. Yeah, there are few there are few exceptions and just like you right. know there, there there are all, there are also uh, you know gay gay gays who also you know that the gay community is split also you know and some of them uh, you know are very supportive of Israel and you know I've met but some it, of them and we we actually uh, some of the, some of the when it, there was a gay group that um, ZOA uh, sort of worked in tandem with when we were trying to get uh, well, the, well, um, you know trying trying to help but get, um, what's his name, the, the, was previously ambassador to Germany, um, get him through the uh, Senate confirmation proceedings. 
you know, push the Senate to move up his confirmation proceedings, which were long, you know, long up, you know, held up. Um, so, you know, it, it's not, it's not, you know, a lot of these things aren't uniform. But, no, that's true, but, there's, but it's kind of disproportionate. And the, the feminist groups really amaze me because there seemed to be more attention on a bus in Israel where some Orthodox Jews wanted men and women to sit separately right. than honor killings in the Arab world or when, when women are raped, they are murdered because they disgrace the family. That doesn't get much attention. Gets okay. some attention, but you know, it's unbelievable what gets attention and what doesn't. I know, totally. Um, Wendy Abraham had a good question. How do you address the huge movement of tikkun olam by Jews, uh, which put Palestinians or others before their own people? How do we challenge that with the Hillel statement about me first, and if not, who? That's a, a, another question about activism, which I feel less qualified to talk about, about having not been on the front line so much. So uh, I'm happy to hear other people comment on that one. I mean, I know at COA we've worked at, you know, we're dealt with, we deal with that a lot. And, you know, just you know, basically trying to talk to people, tell people the truth again, but it's, you know, it's a problem. I was at the World Zionist Congress. So um, yeah, I, I'm ZOA's delegate there last October. There was a woman from South Africa who was upset. We had, we had a panel about anti-Semitism all over the world and you know, the attacks on, on Jews and, and, uh, she was complaining that it was one-sided, that we weren't showing the Palestinian perspective. This is a reform woman from South Africa, and she, she uh, started saying, well, the most beautiful thing about uh, Judaism is our, our concern for the other, and it's not. You know, we went over and tried to talk to her, and it was like talking to a wall, but a lot of times you keep talking, you keep talking, and if something sinks in, um, and, uh, you know, some people have been known to change their views, and I think it's important to let people know that tikkun olam is not the be-all and end-all of Judaism, that we, it, you know, we're supposed to care about our own lives and our own people's lives and try to, you know, let them know, you know, again, as Mort had said before, uh, mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, Farrell, do you, do you want to make some closing? I, I'm sorry, I, I mean, I can't get to every single comment. There are so many wonderful comments. Um, well, and yeah, yeah, first of all, I'm, again, I thank you and Mort for inviting me today and uh, all the people for attending. I really appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I'm honored and privileged to speak before this group, and I, I hope some of the reasons I suggested may lead people to come up with ideas on how to confront people who have those particular views. Um, but um, I, I hope you'll read my book. I'm happy to continue the dialogue. Uh, if anyone wants to, uh, you can always uh, contact me or uh, through ZOA or, or um, you know, leave comments on the Amazon website. I'm always interested in that. Or I'm always interested in new ideas that people may have. So again, I just am very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, to have talked to you today, and I, I appreciate you all attending. It was an honor to have you here. I wanted to thank everybody for being on the call, and also let you know about our next book club meeting, which is The Oslo Syndrome, which is a very important book by a psychiatrist, which really deals with some of what we've been dealing, talking about today, um, The uh, Delusions of a People Under Siege. Um, and it, 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 Dr. Kev, Kevin, uh, K uh, Kenneth Levin is a psychiatrist who deals with the psychological phenomenon of, uh, is, you know, very similar to, you know, it's, it's just some similarities to what we were speaking about today. So I hope you'll all, all enjoy it and join us then. It's going to be next Wednesday at one o'clock. And I also wanted to thank you and please, you know, if, you know, I know times are difficult for everybody now, if you can help COA out now and with our, with our important work. We really appreciate it if you can donate to us, coa.org. And I look yeah. forward to seeing I look forward to seeing everybody uh Can someone speak at the end? Yeah. What? yeah, I will in a second. Is somebody speaking? I, I really look forward to to seeing everybody uh next Wednesday and thank you for being such a great group. Thank, thank you, you. Yeah, thank it was you. an honor to have you, Cheryl.